But first this week, the case of a blogger in Saudi Arabia, imprisoned for more than a month because of his postings on the internet. Fuad al fahans plight has sent cyberspace a buzz and highlighted concerns about free speech and media freedom in the country. Senior international correspondent Nick Robertson has our report. Fuad al farhans face smiles out from the websites calling for his release. His friends, fellow bloggers, want him out of Saudi jail, where he's been since last December 10th without charge. All the man did was exercise in his right of free speech. He didn't threat anyone, he didn't call for violence or hate. He just called for what he thinks was his rights and freedom of expression and, and justice. Al Omran, who like Al Farhan blogs in his own name, is spearheading the campaign. All the bloggers and his friends are campaigning. We started uh, a campaign online, a new website called freefire.com. And also we have a Facebook group with more than 800 members now from all around the world calling for his release. A 32-year-old businessman, married with two children, Al Farhan took up blogging several years ago. From top-end internet cafes to low-cost web access outlets, Al Farhan was popular, but not apparently with everyone. Last summer, officials advised him to stop. He restarted several months later, publishing a list of 25 reasons to blog, top among them, because we believe we have opinions that deserve to be heard because societies do not progress until they respect the opinion of their members, and because blogging is our only option. We do not have a free media, and freedom to assemble is not allowed. Then, in December, he published a list of ten least favoured Saudi personalities. About two weeks before he was detained, Al Fahan told friends he thought he might be in trouble for what he'd written about political prisoners. He said he heard that he was going to be asked to apologize, and he wasn't sure if he was ready to do that. And he told his friends that he thought he might go to jail for as long as three days. But if it went any longer, he told them he wanted publicity, because the last thing that he wanted to happen was to end up in jail and be forgotten. But despite the websites and blogosphere's support, Al Farhan's friends are making little progress getting him freed. He's been investigated for violation of local laws, which is an insecurity problem. And no insecurity problem. insecurity problem. His, his, uh, his case is not related to the government, is not related to the Ministry of Interior, or to the police, or to the security situation. Under Saudi law, Al Farhan can be held for six months before being charged. Nick Robertson, CNN, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The internet and blogs have boomed in recent years, particularly in Arab countries banned by strict media controls. So, is there evidence suggesting governments in the region are using their influence to target bloggers? Well, to discuss that, we're joined from Cairo by Wael Abbas. He's faced pressure from the Egyptian government over material he's posted on the web. And also with us is Joel Campagna, Senior Program Coordinator for the Middle East with the Committee to Protect Journalists. He's in Austin. Well, first of all, uh, you, you have become quite well known as a blogger in Egypt and in, indeed in the region. What prompted you to become a blogger? There was a need for, for an alternative source of media in Egypt uh, since the, uh, all the traditional newspapers and uh, television channels are under the censorship and uh, they, are, they suffer from the interference of security. So there was lots of news that are not really covered by the traditional media and they're, they're, they needed to reach the people. And uh, I saw that Egyptian people needed to, to know what is really going on. They needed some source of information to tell them what is really going on. So that's why I started blogging. If I could turn to Joel in Boston. Joel, the Committee to Protect Journalists, how much research have you done about blogging in the region? And is it a, a movement or a trend that is continuing apace? Uh, we followed it very closely in the Arab world and also globally. If we look at statistics over the last decade, there's been rising persecution of bloggers throughout the world, including in the Arab world. Just last year, of the 127 journalists in prison worldwide that we documented at the committee, 39% uh, were bloggers. And in the Arab world currently, all of the journalists in prison at the moment, there's three of them by our count, are all bloggers. And is it uh, too early to tell how much this movement in the region might have ultimately on the social and political situations in the individual countries? 
I do think uh, there has been an impact. We've seen it. Blogs are, are, are very influential in the sense that uh, journalists read them, activists read them, uh, and they take these ideas to uh, do their uh, democracy promotion activism in places like Egypt. I think Wa'al Abbas's blog is a great example of that, some of the reporting that uh, he has done on torture, and it has helped energize people in Egypt following those issues. Well, do you feel that you're having an impact on Egyptian society with your blogging? Um, a kind of. Uh, I cannot claim that I have a great impact, but at least I was I was successful in uh, exposing some cases of torture in society, and uh, this encouraged a lot of people who were subject to torture and police station or to harassment from the police to come forward and uh, accuse the officers who did that to them and take this take them to court. And some uh, officers were actually convicted and sent to jail for that. So this is a good thing because we never had that in the past. We never had officers being sent to jail for uh, torture and uh, we, we, people were so too afraid to uh, say that uh, they were subject to something like that. So this is, this is not really the change that I wanted to make, but at, at least it is, this is something. Uh, well, you've had your internet accounts uh, with Yahoo and YouTube closed down temporarily. They've since been reopened. Um, how do you view or what did you hear from those service providers uh, about why your account had been closed down? Concerning YouTube, they sent me an email saying, saying that uh, we, uh, we uh, closed your account because we received lots of complaints saying that you had inappropriate material on your account, uh, especially torture videos. And Yahoo, ju Yahoo just shut down my account without giving any explanation. And uh, I had to contact both. YouTube never answered, what, but they answered only to journalists when journalists asked them uh, why did, did they shut down my account. And uh, Yahoo just returned my account silently. Joel, in Boston, this is, uh, raises another issue for the service providers themselves. Uh, uh, do they have a coherent policy, or is it your understanding that they react to each uh, blogger and each uh, sensitive account individually? Well, you know, it, it's something groups are uh, like CPJ are, are starting to address and to, to look at issues uh, of, of how groups like Yahoo, Google are handling uh, issues of free flow of information. Uh, the case of Wa'al with YouTube was one we uh, looked into when his uh, account was closed and uh, the response was that uh, this was a, uh, a, a normal uh, complaint process uh, and that there was no intention to uh, censor him and that his account was uh, restored. But of course, uh, as Wa'al will tell you, uh, much of the information he had stored uh, over a long period of time was lost. So uh, it is an issue that uh, press freedom groups like CPJ and others uh, are looking into as to how uh, these big companies are managing uh, the information that they uh, control or, or provide uh, to uh, people who use their services. Very must leave it, but Joel Campagna of the CPJ in Boston, thank you very much indeed, and also Wael Abbas in Cairo, thanks for joining us.